examples. I want you to learn a Greek word, all right? The Greek word, eh, let's transliterate it back to the Greek from English, T-U-P-O-S, pronounced in the English tongue or the Greek tongue, tupus, tupus. Tupus is a word, let, let's go to, I, I love etymologies, you know, that's to say, how did that word get started? Well, it came from hitting or striking, you know, to give it a blow. And it isn't the hitting or the blow that gives you the connotation of the word, it's what it leaves, okay, the mark, the, um, the um, uh, mold, or whatever is left over from the striking, okay? It leaves a pattern. It leaves a, a forensic expert could just really do wonders with this, could he not? But a preacher can too, a teacher can. What it is then, it leaves a mold or an example, and that's the tool that our Father chose to teach you. Now, it can be what it is, is the original. Let's say that a teacher can, she's, she, she's gifted, and she can give you the original. God chooses people to bring forth originals occasionally, even though there's nothing new under the sun. And that teacher can draw a beautiful picture, and then she gives it to a child and tells that child to go to the window and trace trace over the picture and paint it. And you know what? That child's going to do pretty good. I mean, why wouldn't the child? They got the pattern. They've got the remains of the strike, the original, to go by, to fashion after. And really, that's basically what God's Word is about. And when you plant seeds, don't ever forget that. Again, I say, God occasionally sends an original. Let's say like Isaiah. He sent Isaiah with an original prophecy, though it was the same. But it struck types that we to this day can use as examples to keep you out of trouble, to keep you from making the same mistakes they made over and over and over again. See, sometimes people, I think, just like to make mistakes. Because God sent you the letter that tells you how to prevent them. It's kind of a shame not to. You know, this is perhaps a digression, but I, have think, I think I have received more letters this year already from people saying, uh, I started three years ago when you advised come out of usury. And this month or the middle of this year, I'm celebrating. I'm out. And I'm not going back, you know. But I think I've received more letters from people from Canada, the Americas, to the world that have listened to our Father's advice and have bettered themselves. And they're happy. They've, uh, you know, our Father tells us all fa facets of life, how that we may be successful. But the most important thing is that you're successful in teaching His Word. And if a child can take the pattern drawn by the expert, the artist, and trace a picture and color it and have it look pretty good, then you can certainly trace the teachings of God's Word from the image that He has given you and practice it, live it. And that's what God's Word and teaching is about. Let's document that. You know, I might say before I begin, tupas is a word that I remembered that Moses struck the rock twice. Well, now once was too much. All he asked, God asked him was to speak to it. But he did leave a mark. But the perfect mark would come because or, or this symbolizes that perfect mark in our lives. The only thing perfect about us, and that is to say Christ. So don't ever forget, 
He is our um, uh, tupas. He is the pattern that we are to follow. Can we do it? No, because we're not perfect. We slip up. We mess up. But that's fine. Get up. Get up. Come up swinging. Don't just get up and say, I'm sorry. I mean, come up fighting. Mostly at yourself for having messed up. And get it together. Because you are a can-do type person. Don't get up and get on a pity part. Oh, God, I'm just, of all people, most unfortunate. <laughs> Well, Satan doesn't think you're all that much of a catch, probably, so when you get on, especially if you're on a pity party, he doesn't want you. Not too many other people do, quite frankly. Usually if someone drops by and says, hey, how are you today? They haven't got 30 minutes, friend. They're just being polite, okay? So think about it. The pattern is set. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, the great book that we just finished on live broadcast open to chapter 10 and this is kind of the foundation of tupas so that is to say the example the mark the image the pattern the mold of your life the mold that if you stick to it you're going to be all right and paul brings this to light um, and he teaches now verse 10 of chapter 10. I'm sorry, verse 11 now of chapter 10. 1 Corinthians, and it reads, Now all these things happened unto them for in samples. That's an old Anglo-Saxon word that means example. All right? That's tupas in the, in the manuscripts. It came as the strike that you can follow, the type, the anti-type, so that it's all figured out for you. It's all laid out there. All you've got to do is trace it. It's that simple. Don't mess up. It happened as examples, and they are written for our admonition. It's for a warning. It's there for a warning. You know what a warning is? A warning is, hey, if you do this, you're going to mess up, and you're going to pay big time. Okay? Oh, surely that's not true. Don't worry, you will. Some people have to learn the hard way, but that's, maybe that's good too, you know, that pretty quick they'll get the message. It's a warning. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now that makes it very important to you now because you happen to be in that generation of the fig tree when the end is going to come on your watch. I don't know why you're living at this time. It makes you pretty special because even the prophets wanted to live in this watch. I would stand my watch well and I would be at attention when it's time to be at attention. And I would never slack off any more than parade rest if I were you as far as spiritual things are concerned. Verse 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh Oh, man's a great thinker. I think I'll, I think I'll just, well, I, on the other I think I'll just, why don't you go back and check it out? You know, sometimes when you're doing your heavy thinking, it, you could keep out of trouble, okay? When man thinketh he standeth, take heed lest ye, he fall. I mean, that's when sometimes you're really headed for the big one. I mean, topsy-turvy, over the edge type thing. In other words, you've got all these types. Why not check them out? Let them grow familiar in your mind, whereby you have instant recall. Not necessarily scripture and verse, book and verse, but at least it's a story. It's a story of our people. Surely you can remember that. It reads like a novel. It all started in the garden and it progressed forward from that. One of the most fascinating stories in the world. Verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. If you ever get on one of these pity parties, oh, the whole thing happens to me. Oh, God, let this happen. No, it's happened to everybody. You're not any different. You're nothing special that trouble comes to. If trouble comes to you, it means you've let your guard down. 
So get off your pity party and fix it. Stand up and act like a man or a woman of God. Ask God to help you in it, all right? Because there is nothing going to happen to you that isn't very common and happens to everybody. Well, I wonder if somebody else has ever had that feeling or desire. How many times? Over and over, you're not unusual. You're not unique in that respect. We all live in the same world. I guess we could double back to last week's, can you cut it? Okay, of course you can. Why? Because you've got the blueprint. Your teacher, the one that set forth this word, that sent you this letter, all you've got to do is take it to the window and trace it. And you're in business. You've got it made. Okay? Common to man. But God is faithful who will not. I repeat, God will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. You know, that kind of separates the men from the boys when it comes to faith. About the time it gets so bad it looks like you can't make it another step. About the time it looks like you're about to sink. The weak give up. But those with faith know of a certainty that he's going to give you a way out before you go under. You're going to make it. That's called faith. That's called reality. And reality will pull you through every time. And God is at the other end of that reality. He set the stage. He wrote the book. He sent you the diagram. You are never as long as you're in the Word, going to get into a trouble that you're not going to whip and come through it. God has promised it. His Word is good. If you ever need someone that can personally vouch for that, come to me. Because I can certainly vouch for it time after time after time. Verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Now what's an idol? It's a figure. It's a pattern. There it stands. It's a mold. Do you want to let it be your mold? And an idol is something that you let yourself give in to. I mean, it, it is what you place your faith in, basically. It's anything you let come before or between you and God. It could even be a job or an automobile. Or a person. You might let a person come between you and God. Don't let it happen. It's wonderful to love God's children, but love them less than you do God. Okay? Or, quite frankly... Next time you get in trouble, his promise will not apply to you. You see, there are conditions on that. And you may not make it through. But stay in his word. Let him know you love him. You know, trust and faith is a very simple thing. And it, it's just human nature that human beings need put their faith in something. And they always do. It may be the wrong thing. It may be an idol. Maybe some religion that's so far off the wall that you couldn't document it anywhere in God's Word by any means. But they'll hang it all out on it, like drinking uh, Kool-Aid and stuff like that, okay, to make the point. Be careful. Even in the guise of many, I, many that are idolatrous, do it in the name of religion. Christianity is not a religion, it's a reality, and when God says He'll pull you through, He will. Period. Nothing else need be said about it. Verse 15. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. In other words, you absorb it, soak it in, and let it settle in your mind, if you're wise. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? In other words, Christ is our perfect example. 
and that's why we break that communion. He is the chief tupas. That's to say the tracing, the map, the mold. Don't ever think you're going to get that good or you would probably become a self-righteous hypocrite in the flesh is what I speak of. Because I'm sorry, we're all going to fall short. We're all going to disappoint each other. But at the same time, that's what Christianity is about is to reach out and help that sister or brother pick them up. Even when they sin a sin that's gross, and help them regain their balance and get back on track. For your perfect example paid the price on the cross that all may succeed. You can always go through. You can always find that God will work it out for you. He can do things that you and I can't. He can take a person that's even an unbeliever that might have be the key to the answer to your problems and take their little old brain and just wind it like a clock, and the next thing you know, they come over and say, ah, let's just forget about that lawsuit, or let's forget about so on. I mean, mean, God can, I've seen it happen, to take a non-believer and change their mind for the benefit of someone that he loves and that trusts him and that has faith. God can always find that he is good for his word, all right? Believe it. And if you don't believe it, it will not be true in your case. You've got to have, a, have faith and, uh, and to believe. Okay, book of Acts. So let's go to another pattern. I want to go to Stephen. He's, Stephen is one of my heroes. Stephen gave the entire message of God's word in one short chapter. In that one short chapter, what he taught there cost him his life. But boy, has it opened the word of God to many, many people. As Stephen stood before the enemy and declared the word of God. Let's pick it up if we may. Here he's giving the history of our people. How they would mess up, how God would lead them. Let's pick it up in verse 41 as he describes the wandering after escape from Pharaoh. Verse 41, Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, verse 41. And it reads, verse 41, Acts chapter 7. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol. There was their little figure and rejoiced in the works of their own hands, not God's. Own little thing. Well, Moses is not back, and we want to worship something. That's the way people are. You want to be careful when you start following people, okay? Next thing you know, one will come over and say, Hey, how long has it been since you had a good laugh? Well, it's been a while. Well, come down to my church. We're going to laugh a lot. We're the church of laughing. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, that's the way it goes. I mean, you know, they'll lead you down Primrose Lane. Here is your example, all right? Now, um, and all of you folks in television land, I'm sure you'll enjoy that. I'm just making friends and influencing people here. Verse 42. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. Hey, he'll give up on you. Don't you ever think for a moment that you can't take one step too far. And you might even do it in the name of religion. Because it was worship that he gave them up for. He said, you go worship the uh, host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slaying beast and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness. 43, sharpen up. Yea, he took up the t- yea, ye rather took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Raphan figures. What do you want to guess that that word figures is in the Greek manuscripts? You got it, thupos. Right? Images, tracings. It's what you set in your mind, your little old heart. Figures which you made to worship them. 
and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. What's Babylon? Confusion. I'm going to mess up your little old mind till you're not going to know up from down as far as clarity is concerned. If you want to play religion, God will let you. Why would you want to when you've got the pattern, the true pattern, not a bunch of mumbo jumbo? Verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. What do you reckon that word fashion is in the Hebrew, the Greek manuscripts? Tupas. He said, you saw it, make it exactly like that. What was it? Two archangels. The handles, the ark. What was in it? The Word of God, the Ten Commandments, the manna. Make it exactly that way. Don't change it. Verse 45. Which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus. You know that if you studied with me that that word is Joshua. All right, Joshua of the Old Testament. His name converted from Hebrew to to Greek, to English, is Jesus, but it's speaking of Joshua. Unto the possession of the Gentiles, they lost it, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. God always had must save his people. Poor, misguided, misrepresented bunch of people. Just like to, they like to worship. They sure do. It's just they're not very careful what they worship or who they follow when the perfect pattern Tupas was set forward for them. 46. Who found favor before God and desired to find a uh, tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Oh, just want, just want to find us a place to worship. But Solomon built him an house. He, he built that temple. David didn't. 48. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not, I repeat, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Do you know where he dwells? He dwells in you, the many-membered body. That is the true temple. And don't ever, ever let that thought escape your mind or you're headed for trouble. It doesn't belong in some church building. It is the people that make the church not the building. It, and what does that many-membered body symbolize? The body of Christ. Christ is our temple, our true pattern. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Don't try to put me in some little old house. What house will you build me? Question, saith the Lord. Or what is the place of my rest? I mean, he covers it all, the whole world, the heavens. And man wants to put him in a box. You can't do it. He's, I am that I am. Iya asha iya. He's wherever he chooses to be. And do you know where that is? In the hearts and the minds of those that love him. Now, I'm speaking spiritually now. For never take away the fact and say, we are so important because God is in us. Only a very small portion. He still sits on the throne. All right? Worship Him. Hath not, 50, hath not my hand made all these things? You bet. God created it all. He spoke. Through Christ, it was created. Everything, stars, moon, sun, universe, earth. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do ye. Now, now, now Stephen, he's, he, well, my word, that, Christian, Stephen being a Christian, that would offend those people. That's exactly what he intended it to do. Why? Because they were wrapped up in lies and fairy tales that break people's hearts and steal souls from God to Satan. It's called false teaching, false preaching. 
Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one. Who is that? Christ, of course, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Hey, that's pretty strong stuff talking to the boys in charge, okay? Who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. You had to think for yourself, make up your own little religion. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Boy, that's real, real religion, huh? Go around and just draw the blood, chew on somebody, chew them up and spit them out. I, only boxers, I thought, did that. Group 55. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into, I repeat, not up on, into heaven and saw, saw what? Saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. I mean, that was quite a thing that God privileged him at that moment when he's about to die for his stand, for his bringing forth the blueprint, that's to say the pattern, the, the tupas, the truth, to let him see the very image itself. For what is it besides the things I forementioned? Well, I'll go through it again, the archangel, the tablet of ten, the manna, and so forth. But what, what else was there? The mercy seat. Well, what's the mercy seat? That has a messiah connotation. It means the seat of Christ. Okay? It's part of it. He let him see the real thing at that moment. He let him see the real mercy seat for God is real. God's word is real. And those that have faith in his word are real followers of the tupos, that is to say the pattern. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. They would not listen and ran upon him with one accord. Don't expect too much of the world to listen to you today. We're, we're not super preachers. We're not super teachers. There's very little, very few out of the masses are going to listen to you. Why? They don't want to hear it. They're too busy. Don't want the truth. So, don't, don't, uh, it amazes me when I see some Christian. Oh, I've got the truth. Did you see that? Oh, I understand that. I'm going to run out and save the world. <laughs> well, Christ tried that, you know, save the world. And they run out there and it's like some little kid running up to a brick wall and just beating their head against it till it's bloody, you know, thinking they're, they're something just because they got a little bit of smarts once in their life, you know, that they could see the truth. Be careful. Use common sense. Be moderate at all times. Um, if you think I'm telling you to cool your spirit or cool your heels, you're mistaken. I'm just saying don't expect too much from yourself. Because yourself, may I say it, it ain't going to do nothing. But you and God as a team might do a lot if you'll take his word and give it credit and use it, the tool he provides for you. 58, and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Saul helped those coats. He did not cast stones, all right? Just want you to draw your attention to that. Saul is Paul, the writer of most of the New Testament. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. 60, and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He gave his life to present the truth to that little group there. No, to you today and to the world that this would become part of the word of God. That people could understand that if you follow the pattern, God will let you see the temple. Strengthen your faith to know of a reality 
that he sees you, that he knows you, that he loves you, that he touches you, touches your heart. It's called the Holy Spirit touching you, that he has use for you. He looked at little David out in the whole adult army of Israel fell by the wayside. Bunch of cowards. Well, maybe they had reason to. That sucker was big, okay? I mean, he was a big giant. Didn't worry David. And out of the mouth of that babe is the words Christ warned. When he said out of the mouth of babes you could be saved, go back and read what that babe said. He said, come on, giant. Because me and my God can do anything. And he believed that. And guess what? Poor old Goliath. He might have been big, but he didn't have a head by the time the sun set that day. All right? But what did the babe say? Me and my God. Or is it my God and I? You know, whichever. Gets the same thing done, doesn't it? All right? Don't forget it. God uses whomever he chooses. And he can destroy giants with little children if they have the faith. He can do it with men and women also. Sometimes it's harder for men and women to have the faith of a child when they say, would you answer this question for me? And they're going to believe what you tell them. That's why you want to be real careful when you're teaching children. Go to Philippians. <clears throat> We're going to talk about a little different type pattern here. Patterns that you can use. Chapter 3, verse 11 of Philippians, and it reads, If, chapter 3, Philippians, verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Oh, Paul, this is Paul speaking. He said, if, there's, if I have a chance just to be resurrected like Christ was, if I can be that good, do you know what that means? He had faults. Just like you. He, had, he fell short. Verse 12. Not as though I had already attained. I haven't captured it yet. Either, have, uh, either were ready. Per, uh, I'm sorry. Either were already perfect, but I follow after, there's that word follow, example, after, if that I may apprehend or capture that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus has captured me. I want to capture the golden ring. I want to graduate into that class of resurrected uh, people that overcome. Now you can, and you don't have to be perfect to do it. If you had to be perfect to do it, I'm afraid you'd already be there. Because nobody in the flesh is perfect. We all fall short. But on repentance, it's wiped away and you are perfect for a while, okay? 13, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, to, to captured it yet. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. Do you know that's one of our main hang-ups when it comes to overcoming? Oh, my Lord, how could I ever forget that time? Oh, I was like one of the devil's own children. Now, they've already repented for this, but from what's behind... Oh, I was such a sinner. Do you know what that's worth? If you're a true Christian and Christ has forgiven you, what are you even thinking about it for other than having it locked away in your memory for educational purposes? What does that mean? A smart person doesn't do it again. Okay? That's what it's good for, for you and only in that part. To educate you, don't do it again. All right? Doesn't make it all right the first time. But Paul is saying, just get rid of that's behind me. Why? It had been forgiven. And if you want trouble, just go ahead and talk about something you've asked Christ to forgive in your life and bring it up again as a sin. Do you understand what you're doing? You're calling Jesus a liar. You understand that? 
It's serious. You're calling Jesus a liar, saying, you didn't forgive it, so it's still a sin. Still there. No, it isn't. If you have faith, it isn't. And if you really want to hurt him, you go ahead. Try it. And bring up something seriously that you have already asked and he has forgiven. Like crucifying him all over again. Talk about being patient. 14. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We all do in the flesh. Don't ever think that you're some real special sinner. All right. It's all common to everybody. 15. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. Perfect here in the Greek means mature. All right. Mature. Not perfect. Be thus minded, and if in anything you be otherwise minded, that's to say, if you have any other attitude, God shall reveal even this unto you. Um, if uh, there is some minor point that you don't catch, don't worry, he'll bring it to your mind as long as you follow his pattern. Follow that prize. Go for it. But this is how you go for it, is from his word. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Let's live up to it. Let's try to do it. Yep, you're going to fall short. I don't know, that may sound like I'm saying you've got a license to sin. Not so. Brethren, be followers together of me. Do you know what followers are? It's not tupas here, but it's the same thing. Use me as an example. That's the reason we came here. Is sometimes you have to use people. Here, I think we can trust Paul to use him. He was persecuted enough that he sets a good example. And he's honest. He's admitting here, hey, I'm not perfect, but I am mature. I don't think like a child. I think like a man of God, all right? Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as... Ye have us for an in sample. There you do have two boss. You've got the pattern. Walk after us. Walk the way we have walked. Now maturity lets you know at the same time, yep, he's still striving for the mark and so are we. All right? So there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, 18. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. I tell you with tears in my eyes that they've slipped away and are looking at another mark, another example, and are actually, now think about this, they become enemies of Christ. Do you know that Christians can do that? So-called Christians can become enemies of Christ? Hey, Talk to a pastor sometime, okay? Well-meaning people can have some of the, have, can have a serpent tongue. I said well-meaning people can have a serpent tongue when it comes to gossiping about others. The, one of, uh, to me, I would rather see someone turn into harlotry, and there's no gender in that, okay? Male or female than I would to see some malicious gossiper come walking into this church and want membership. Because that's trouble going somewhere to happen. It's one of the most terrible sins in the world. They're an enemy of Christ. Do you, now, first of all, let me... Uh, a malicious gossiper is a gossiper that says things to hurt. It's not just somebody saying, I think she has pretty hair or... Or I think he is this, that, or the other. It's somebody that spreads tales that they have absolutely no proof of that can destroy lives. Now that's Satan coming out the gate. Glad we don't have any of those in this church, this body, okay? But be on guard in your study groups and everywhere else. Hey, they're out there and they're a dime a dozen, okay? 19, whose end is destruction whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Just really get with it. 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look 
for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Now here we're getting down to the nitty gritty. Talk about a type that you want to be fashioned after, made like, struck after. And when I say struck, I mean like a coin is struck, okay? Um, according to, to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. He's got the power. And when you're like unto him and trying, he's going to subdue those things that would attack you. Boy, I tell you something. If people only knew when they start messing with God's election, they're messing with trouble. Real trouble. Because God will destroy them. He won't put up. When he said, don't touch mine anointed, he meant it. He didn't say it in a real sweet way. He said it with vigor. And he is a jealous God. And he is certainly jealous when somebody hankies with his bride-to-be. Okay? Just, that's why he says you can pray for your enemies because they're going to need prayer. All right? He's going he's gonna to fix their wagon. He'll grease their wheel. He'll fix their squeak. All right? Now, just to, how are we doing on, oh, we got lots of time. <clears throat> lots of time. Nobody's beans are burning yet. The kids are still in Sunday school. Everything is wonderful. Where are we going from here? We're going to 2 Thessalonians. Okay? And we're going to put this right down where the rubber meets the road. Christians are strange creatures. Sometimes, you know, we look at the perfect pattern... And if you're not careful, you become a walking mat for other people. Christians have these big old bleeding hearts. And, and they're afraid to say, if somebody steps on their toe, say, get off my foot. If they don't hear you the first time, hey, that person that gets hurt and say, get off my foot. Don't, don't be afraid to take care of yourself, all right? And then say, bless you, brother, that hurt. <laughs> you know, you, you, it's... Like the old boy in the oil field, he was, he was from Texas, and Texas people do. They're very polite, and they talk very slow. He says, boys, move the chain. You've got it on my finger. <laughs> you know, I was cutting it off. You know? <laughs> or the old boy that picked up the horseshoe, and he says, boy, that's hot. <laughs> Dropped it, <you> know? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful people. We got them guests today. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, all right. We're going to go here to the sixth verse. Don't let people walk on you. Love them. But well, what if it's my brother? Well, that's why I wanted to use this spot, this example, so that you would know how to do your own family. Love them. Don't drive them away if you can help it. But if you have to, this is what you do. Verse 6, 2 Thessalonians Chapter 3, and that verse 6, you all were just waiting for that, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, I get wrapped up in what I'm doing, and I forget to, I know where we're going. I just read it, see? Made those notes. I knew we were going to chapter 3. I just forgot to tell you. That's all. Chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians, verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, that's pretty strong, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Well, I thought he said Christians were supposed to be friendly. I, I thought we had to be friends. No, no, that isn't what he said at all. He said, get along with your neighbor if it be possible. Okay? So it's the same way with your brother. If he's, if he's chastened idols, false religions, if he's going down here where they just laugh and get it off their chest and then go home, okay, or they blow their breath on each other or something else and fall out and don't get picked back up by the Lord, you know, and just jumble, 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 you know, 
Well, wonder about it. You don't have to go with them. You can stay home in the comfort of your own home and study God's Word and be blessed, you know. If somebody does it different than this Word says, get away from them. You don't have to. After you plant a seed, give a warning, and it isn't taken, you don't have to be a, a, a walking mat for anybody, all right? But that doesn't mean to be mean to them, all right? You got the difference there, okay? Tell them where the cow eat the cabbage. Got it in a nice way. Just, I mean, shuck it down and get it done, all right? Verse 7, for yourselves know how you ought to follow us. There's that word follow, imitate. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. We weren't loafing. We were working. We were producing. We weren't gossiping. Verse 8. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought or worked with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. We wanted to show you, to be an example, to show you how it is done. All right? Verse 9. Not because we have not power. We, we had the right to take a salary from you, but we didn't. But to make ourselves an ensample, to be an example. There's the word. Tupas. All right? To be an example that you could follow. Unto you to follow us. Ten. For even when we were with you. This we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. I find that a fascinating thing, and you've heard me use it many times on television and other places, that, hey, if you got some lazy bum, throw him out. Don't feed him, you know. And don't worry about, well, what about my baby? The sucker weighs 200 pounds, and mama says, this is my baby, you know. There's a micro switch between his belly button and his backbone that when he won't work, that when it gets just about that far apart, it triggers a mechanism up here in the brain and he becomes a zealous worker. If I don't work, I'm going to starve. Well, sucker, that's what mama tried to tell you coming out the gate. All right. But now, the thing is, this has a double meaning, and I want to share it with you. If you won't work, first of all, the famine in these end times is not for bread. It's for hearing and understanding the Word of God. If you are too lazy to work at understanding God's Word and the example of it, just mark that brother. He's not going to have anything to eat, meaning spiritual food. Not going to understand. It's going to go over their head. They can't get it because they do not work at following up. But I thought all we had to do was believe. Well, that's not what the Word says. And it can get hungry. Okay. I can imagine, you know, as long as I've been in the ministry, if I hadn't worked, you know, like every, every message I give has got to be new, okay? Because everything I've ever given is recorded. You know, there's, if there's a rec record down there in that building and other places. So I, to be worth my salt, I feel I've got to give a fresh message every time. Or they might do me here like they do some of these other preachers. Hey, keep him three years and ship that sucker out. <laughs> you know, we've heard everything he's got to say. Well, usually you can do that in one setting. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> You've got to work. And you know something? It pays great dividends. Because anytime you begin to think you know it all, your feast is just about over. Because God dislikes people that think they know it all. And somebody that thinks they know it all are just a bore to some of us that do. You know, it's just, it's just, the, way it is. It's just the way it is. I, I, I'm sorry. My Irish is beginning to boil. I've got to quit pretty soon or it's going to get totally out of hand. All right? But work at it. Don't give up. Keep working. 
But, but it also means one of these old hairy-legged boys that just expects the world to owe him a living. Hey, get it from God's word. He ain't no good. I say it again. He ain't no good the way he is, but you can help him by doing a very simple thing. Cut off his grub. Do you know what grub? I'm cut off his grub means food. Now, let's get this straight so you don't... Yeah, that'll do it. All right. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> Verse 11. Uh, we better finish this pretty quick right here, okay? Verse 11. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, uh, that means a little bit lazy, working not at all, but are busybodies. That means they're gossiping, telling stories on other people that ever turn. They got plenty of time to make a bunch of stuff up, all right? Now, them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work. You know what that means? It means keep your mouth shut. If you haven't got something good to say about somebody, you haven't got anything to say. Work, do God's work, but if you haven't got anything good to say, keep your mouth shut, okay? And eat their own bread. In other words, dig it out for yourself for a while if you have to. Verse 13, but ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. If you do it right, you never will be. You know, I can honestly say that I, I teach a lot of hours through the month, a lot of them. And I have, to, I have to work hard to do that. I, just, I have a gift, yes, thank God for that. But if I didn't work hard, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be any good. And I do know I am good. Okay. <laughs> because I teach the Word, and the Word's good. You got it made on a deal like that, okay? But you have to work hard to be good. Don't worry, I, you know, it's easy to say. On television, you either have it or you don't. And in teaching, you either have it or you don't. And do you know something? Nobody knows what it is. They don't. You can't buy it. You can't sell it. Nobody knows what it is. And I think maybe that it might have something to do with Tupas, you know, is the example as to how close you can follow it. And different subject, different time. How are we doing on time? Beans about done? Well, let's wind this up then. I tell you, I, I really, that was the last scripture I was going to use. But, you know, it's bothering me that I'm not bearing down at least once on the, um, the real example we have set. Yes, I've alluded to it a time or two, but um, if you would, Go to 1 Peter. Real quickly in closing. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. And I think, I hope after the teaching we've laid the groundwork for, I won't have to say two words, but that would be almost impossible for me, but... It might be better off if that's all I said, okay? Here we go, 21, second chapter, 1 Peter. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, tupas, that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. I mean, perfect. Think about that. This is a good record for you to look at sometimes whenever you think you're falling short or you need a little guidance. Look at this. Don't try to match it necessarily. Uh, well, do try. But don't be disappointed if you don't because there was only one, and that was the original Christ, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, and when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. To him that said, touch not mine anointed, and will stomp their toes. Okay? That word righteous makes it sweet, but it means he's gonna, he'll take care of it and he'll do what's right. Well, if they curse Christ, they deserve a thumping. And he's going to give it to them. Don't ever worry about it. All right? I said I wasn't going to say anything let you figure this out yourself. But I just, 
the way it goes, I guess, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his body. Think about it. That's why he doesn't like for you to bring it up again. I want to make that point. That's why he doesn't like for you to say, oh, God, I, what a night I sinned and sinned and sinned. You know, and you'd already repented. He didn't want to hear it. How many times do you want him to bear it for you? Okay. Being dead to sin shall live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye are healed. For ye were asleep going astray. But I'm sorry, that sheep, isn't it? Some of you might have been asleep too. I don't know. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. He is your true shepherd. He is the pattern. He is the tupas. He is the one that gives us our way, that has brought this word forward. He is the living word. And that word is your pattern. Every problem that you've ever had is very common to all men. And God has worked it out in this book. Absorb it. And thank God you, have, you are really working at that as I'm working at it. As we're all working at it together. As the Holy Spirit gives us unction, knowledge, and wisdom. To just go over and trace the life pattern off that window. And when you look at that picture and you see this pitfall, you say, uh-oh. That's a no-no. Then draw a place around it and go around it. Don't fall in the pit. It's that simple. God is so special when he teaches. It's like he's teaching a bunch of little children and thank God for that. You know, because sometimes I think we would never understand. He set the course. Thank him for that. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for being with us. We ask uh, to gain that knowledge. Help us in that. In Yeshua's precious name, amen. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.